seem to accomplish the governance of world trusts. Now, that's one of the things which, towards the end of the Middle Ages, some theologians and philosophers objected to. William of Ockham claimed that this um, prevents God's sovereignty over the processes of nature. It means that God has to always be subservient to these essential unchanging forms. Uh, Martin Luther similarly, influenced by William of Ockham. Uh, and I think John Calvin also, though not as extreme as Luther or Ockham, um, emphasizing the direct sovereignty of God and his powerful action, rather than divinely created natural processes with their own potency. Okay. So um, watch for this as we go along. Uh, while the model, the Plato, Aristotle model of real forms at work, provides a powerful conceptual framework for Judeo-Christian and Islamic theology throughout the Middle Ages, it also um, was the focus of considerable opposition towards the end of the Middle Ages. And we'll, we'll have to trace that kind of thing. Okay, any questions uh, thus far? Those four kinds of causes. Clear enough, David? You spoke of chance. You said there was extraneous causes. Yeah. Nature, nature's processes. You might regard it as this way. Um, here is one natural process in which mosquitoes develop and make their way around. Here is another natural process in which a human being developing is making his way on a summer evening. The two intersect, and you know what happens. You get bit, you see. Now, um, the, the mosquito, and what it does, is extraneous to the essential nature of the human being. You see. There are intrinsic, necessary causes. There are also extraneous, contingent causes. And it's the extraneous, contingent ones that produce what he calls what is accidental rather than what is essential. Fair enough. Uh, you know, you can um, talk that way in the development of um, a human being as well. Um, what example do I want to take? Yeah, the kind of diet accessible to your mother while she was carrying you affects the, um, the kind of physique you have subsequently. Now, the natural genetic process has its end, okay, but then there are incidental processes which affect her diet and therefore have their effect on you. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can take his word cause, used in this large sense, as um, synonymous to his term principle. Okay? Now, you remember he said that a science is interested in the first principles of the science. Uh, what are the first principles? Well, what the scientist wants to do is to understand, for instance, in, uh, in biology, um, the essential nature of life. Okay. Biology, literally, the science of life. Uh, the nature of life, and Aristotle, incidentally, was a biological vitalist. Life is essentially something different from material chemical processes. Okay. Uh, he wants to understand the nature of life. He wants to understand the material elements involved. He wants to understand the causal processes, in our sense, the forces at work. Okay. He wants to understand, he wants to be able to discern as well, to tell us the purpose, the goal. What this does, this kind of uh, biological process, um, naturally lead to. So um, what the scientist is doing is trying to understand these principles as they um, can be defined within that particular science. His conception of science is that if you can formulate these principles, then you can deduce all sorts of things about particular cases. So that his model of science is that you are formulating premises and deducing conclusions. Okay. Now that conception of science dominates until the beginnings of empirical methods in um, all 14th century. Okay. And was modified, picked up and modified by Descartes, who took uh, mathematical reasoning as a model for science. Okay, the first principles become axioms, self-evident truths, from which all sorts of deductions are made as in geometry. So um, very influential here in philosophy of science. Now, uh, I say then you can think of causes as first principles. Um, you, you might try another synonym. They are explanatory factors. So that in explaining any kind of change, physical, biological, economic, political, moral, any kind of process of change, whatever. Uh, you look for four different kinds of factors. In explaining anything which has emerged, like the institution of law, four factors. Now, Thomas Aquinas gets this from Aristotle. So that Aquinas, in his treatise on law, defines law as an ordinance of reason, that's the formal cause, for the common good, that's the final cause, made by him who has the power, the authority, that's the efficient cause, uh, for the community, the material cause. Now, um, essentially, the same four causes, all over again. When Aquinas talks of divine creation, you see, he's saying the creation has, has an efficient cause, God. The creation has formal cause, the wisdom of God, defining its essential nature, to be like God. It has final cause, to be like God, in its every part. But it has no material cause. Creation was ex nihilo, out of nothing. Well, that's Aquinas' use of it. But this uh, framework governs medieval thought until the rise of mechanistic science, the scientific revolution of the 15th, 16th century. And uh, what happens there, I think you can readily see. Because that mechanistic science accepts efficient cause, sure, forces. Accepts material cause, sure, particles of matter. Okay, matter and motion. Matter and the forces, Newtonian physics. But it has no interest in formal or final causes. So from Aristotle's viewpoint, Newtonian science is only half a science. And then the fascinating further step that happens is as empiricism develops after Newton in people like um, 
David Hume. David Hume says that empirically, using simply empirical methods, we have no knowledge of efficient causes and no knowledge of material causes. So what was Hume's outcome? Skeptic about all knowledge of nature. We know nothing about matters of fact beyond our present experience. But the starting point for the whole discussion is Aristotle's four causes. Okay. Does that help? A long answer to a short question, Carl. Anything else? Okay, let's uh, press on a uh, step further. Okay. Can I exercise you racing these words? Um, being and its categories. Metaphysics, he has told us, is the science of being. The science of being. But um, characteristic of Aristotle, here again, is to ask what do we mean when we say something is? Talk of what is. Ascribe existence to something. Notice that um, being, the idea of being, is used in a whole variety of different ways. And these different ways in which we think of being, he refers to as categories of being. Categories of being. If you like, different ways in which we think about what is, but also different ways in which things are. Okay. Now, one way, and the basic one, in which things are, is as substances. And that's his first category. Substances. So that when we talk about things, we, um, we try to pin down the essence of the substance. But there are many other ways in which we can talk of things which are. Look on page 314 and notice the list of categories that he offers us. 314. This is in uh, book four of his Metaphysics, chapter two. And at the top of the page, he says, there are many senses in which a thing may be said to be, Though all it is is related to one central point, one definite kind of thing, and isn't said to be by mere ambiguity. And he spells that out halfway down the column. Some things are said to be because they are substances. Others because they are affections of substances. Others because they are a process towards substance. Destructions or privations or qualities of substance. Productive or generative of substance. Or things that are relative to substance in relationship to. Or negations of one or another of these things in relationship to substance. Many, many different kinds of being that he refers to. Okay. Now, in part, this is simply his rather encyclopedic scientific interest. You see. Trying to classify everything about which we say it is. It's black, that's the quality. It's round, that's the shape. It's over there, that's the spatial, spatial location. It was here, that's a temporal reference. On and on and on. You see. Different ways in which we say something is. But these are not just categories of thought. They are categories of thought, yes, but they are also categories of being. In other words, it's not just a game playing with ideas speculatively. This he takes to be descriptive of reality. You see? In our minds, we make these distinctions, but they are real distinctions. So that this has to do with the science of being. <laughs> now, whether you're speaking of beings of a biological sort, beings of a simply physical sort, beings of a historical sort, beings of an economic or political sort, you see? There are these categories of being qua being. The science of being gets to make these, these distinctions. But that's not the... Oh, um, oh let me um, uh, pick up on this for a moment. When we get to talking about his logic, we'll come back to these categories. Because he's very insistent that um, it's easy to slip a cog in a reasoning process, in a logical process, and to slip from talking about being in one category and without noticing start talking of being in another category. Yes, and in that, in that case, you're equivocating. You're using the term in two different senses. Yeah. Um, tremendously important. That violates the basic laws of thought. The basic one being the law of non-contradiction. <coughs> that a thing cannot both be and not be something at the same time and in the same respect. But if you change the respect in which you're talking about it, you're talking about something different. You're equivocating. Now, in addition then to the categories of being, notice that I've just said he has laws of being, which are also correspond exactly to laws of thought. Okay. Laws of thought that correspond to the laws of being. And turn there to page 316, where he, uh, 316, 317, uh, in fact, the 10 pages after that, uh, where he talks about the basic law of thought, the law of non-contradiction that A cannot both be and not be at the same time and in the same respect. A thing cannot both be and not be at the same time and in the same respect. Now, he calls this the most certain principle in the middle of the first column on 317. This is the most certain principle of all regarding which it is impossible to be mistaken. For such a principle must be both the best known and non-hypothetical. Principle which everyone must have who understands anything that is. That which everyone must know who knows anything. Evidently, then, such a principle is the most certain. It is that the same attribute cannot at the same time belong and not belong to the same subject and in the same respect. And there's his classic statement of the law of non-contradiction. You cannot be 
tall and not tall at the same time and in the same respect. You cannot be here and not here at the same time and in the same respect. You could say my mind is somewhere else, but your body sure is here at the same time and in the same respect. So um, he, he's very insistent on that. He adds at the top of the second column, it's impossible for anyone to believe the same thing, to be and not to be, to be true and to be false at the same time and in the same respect. Either it's true, it's true, it's false. It can't be both at the same time and in the same respect. Once in a while when you ask me a question, you may notice I, you may pose the question, is it this way or is it not? And you may notice I'll say yes, because I want to get you used to thinking that it can be A or non-A in different respects. In different respects. But not at the same time and in the same respect. Okay. Now, the question is, can a principle like this be demonstrated? Can you have a proof for this law of logic? He said, well, no, you can't really in the usual sense of a positive demonstration, because you have to assume the law of logic in order to prove the law of logic. But while we can't give a positive proof without circularity, he offers a negative demonstration, a negative proof. Look on 318, halfway down the column, the first column. He says the starting point of such an argument is not that our opponents say something either is or is not, but that he say something which is significant. Say something that means something. Um, if he's really to say anything, that's necessary, isn't it? If he means nothing, then he's not capable of reasoning either himself or with another. Uh, if one grants this, demonstration will be possible, for we already have something definite. The person responsible for the proof is not he who demonstrates, but he who listens. While disowning reason, he listens to reason. So forth. Now, next column, right across. Let it be assumed, then, as we said at the beginning, that the name has a meaning and one meaning. It's impossible, then, assuming the word man has only one meaning, it's impossible that being a man should mean not being a man. You see? Cannot mean two opposite things. And if being a man cannot mean not being a man, then you cannot both be and not be a man at the same time and in the same respect. Yeah, his point is this about the negative demonstration. Um, you try to say something, anything. Okay? Carl, say something. A proposition, an assertion. The rug is red. The rug is red. Now, do you mean that the rug is red or that it is not red? red. You mean that it cannot be both red and not red at the same time and in the same respect? You're assuming. Now, supposing Carl had said the law of non-contradiction is false. You see, I would say to him, Carl, do you mean that the law of non-contradiction is false? Or do you mean that it is not? Not false? Either it's false or it's not false. But if you say it's not false, you don't mean that it's not false. Yes, if the law of non-contradiction is false, in order to make that assertion, you have to deny that it is not false. It cannot be false and not false at the same time and in the same respect. If you mean that it's both false and not false, you're not saying anything. I don't know what you mean. In other words, in order to say anything meaningful, you have to assume and follow the law of non-contradiction. Okay? Not only do you have to assume it to argue it, you have to assume it to deny it. And if the denial of it is self-contradictory, because you have to assume it in order to deny it, if denying it is self-contradictory, then there's only one alternative. It must be true. But then form of a simple disjunctive syllogism. Okay. The law of non-contradiction is either false, is either true or false. If the assertion that the law of non-contradiction is false turns out to be self-contradictory, if the falsity is self-contradictory, because you have to assume the law of non-contradiction in order to deny it, okay, if the falsity is self-contradictory, then um, the falsity is itself false. And the only alternative, then, is that uh, the law must be true. The other alternative, right? Okay. If asserting the falsity involves you in a self-contradiction, then asserting the falsity is false. If asserting falsity is false, if falsity is false, then, logically, the thing's true. Okay. Now, that's Aristotle's proof. He calls it a negative demonstration for the law of non-contradiction. And he would challenge you, and I would too, to say anything in violation of the law of non-contradiction that means anything. Now, it's sometimes said that Eastern thought does that. Show us. Show us something that means something. Oh, sure, people can utter gobbledygook that doesn't mean anything. But show us something that means something. That can be both true and false at the same time in the same respect. Now, some people have said that Hegel, with his dialectic thesis and synthesis, synthesis, denies the law of non-contradiction. I can only say they've never read Hegel's logic. Because explicitly, he doesn't deny it. He simply says it's trivial. It's trivial because if you're dealing with a historical process, you're not dealing with things at the same time, but at different times. So the thesis applies at one time, and at a subsequent time, the antithesis may apply. Yes, 